who do you think you are? You're like a trash can. And you'll never be related to my son. Robert already has a worthy bride. And it's not you. These words, spoken by the father of someone dear, resonated in Lisa's mind for a long time. Each word felt like a death sentence for her love. Her mother's tired voice echoed the same. Every cricket knows his own neck. A cruel phrase Lisa had heard since childhood. From a young age, she was convinced that an unusual fate awaited her. Now, while wiping a steamy counter, she bitterly smiled at her childhood dreams. Fate had circled back, bringing her to her place. Perhaps she should give up, return to the village, marry someone ordinary, and have children every year. Maybe this is where she belongs. She doesn't need to strive for anything more. Poverty, loneliness, hopelessness, these are her lot. Lissa contemplated keeping her head down to avoid further pain, as she knew the sting of life's hardships. Looking through the dark windows, she didn't find anything interesting outside but at her reflection, which wasn't particularly captivating. Despite her youth, the black shadows under her eyes marred her appearance. Her chestnut hair, though thick, was just tied in a bundle. Lissa refrained from using makeup, not wanting to draw attention to herself, knowing it wouldn't make a difference. She considered the futility of stealing attention, realizing she would remain just another girl inside, with nothing interesting about her except her name, Elizabeth, a name her father had made up, bringing more mockery than interest. It's quite amusing for a country girl. Elizabeth. Your name is beautiful. You should be happy. Being Elizabeth is like being a queen. And you'll have a very special destiny because a name can make all the difference. Remember that. Said a friend. In response. Lisa's mother scolded. Your parents should have named you something prettier. So you wouldn't be a laughing stock but a decent woman. Your fate would have been better. Not a girl mocked by everyone. The friend continued. They should have named you Elizabeth. It's close to Elizabeth. When you get your passport. Tell them to register you as Elizabeth. Don't make people laugh. You'll live as a fox until old age. And your grandchildren will call you Grandma Lisa. Not Elizabeth. Lisa considered changing her name when getting a passport but couldn't bring herself to do it. Feeling pity for the identity she had grown accustomed to. Despite the mockery. She re- called her father's prophecy that perhaps an unusual name would lead to an unusual fate. Lisa acknowledged the unbearable life she was living. Born in a village where many struggled. Her family stood out due to her father's drinking habits. He worked as a tractor driver. But his salary, after spending it on alcohol, only covered basic necessities. Lisa's mother, often pregnant or caring for a baby, had little time to work. The family lived in poverty. Yet Lisa, besides her unusual name, was smart and excelled in school, recognizing education as her hope to escape the cycle of poverty. Lisa aimed to become a successful, educated, and intelligent person, an outcome different from her parents, who didn't even finish high school. Her father completed some courses to become a tractor driver, and her mother worked on the farm until marriage and starting a family. Lisa was determined to shape a fate she desired, one of success and knowledge. Only by pursuing education and achieving success could Lisa hope to live a decent life and lift her family out of their hopeless poverty. She felt compassion for her parents and younger sisters, yearning for a different life for them. Despite her dreams, many doubted her potential. Her mother, emphasizing the family's struggles, discouraged her aspirations, and even teachers mocked her efforts. Elizabeth, as she was called without any force, faced laughter and skepticism. The prevailing opinion was that a girl from such a family wouldn't make it unless she pursued technical school or, better yet, college. However, financial constraints made attending college seem like an impractical dream. The idea of the daughter going to the city or the best school was out of the question. Undeterred, Lisa dreamed big. In junior high school, she resolved to go to college in the nearby town. With thoughts of potentially going further afterward, maybe to the capital or even abroad for a good job. Despite the challenges at home, including a neglectful, drunken father and electricity cuts, Lisa clung to her dreams of a better future. 
Her vision included helping her family escape poverty and proving wrong those who doubted her capabilities. Despite her parents' reluctance to let her go, Lisa held firm to her dream. When she graduated from high school, her mother suggested finding work on a farm, taking care of animals and earning a modest income. However, Lisa was determined not to settle for a life that echoed the struggles of her family. The mention of her older brother Phil, a victim of their father's actions, reinforced her resolve to break free from the cycle of hardships. A few years ago, after completing his service in the army, he departed from his homeland. Rumors suggest that he never recalled his father or sisters thereafter. Speculations indicate that he secured a job and even entered matrimony in the city. But he neither returned home nor corresponded. In contrast, the speaker reassures their mother, expressing the commitment to stay connected, write letters, and send money earned. The speaker envisions a future where they will repair the house, settle debts, and ensure well-being. While emphasizing loyalty, the speaker reflects on the daughter of Katerina, who left for studies with promises of financial support but returned after two years without a husband. The speaker pledges unwavering support to their mother and acknowledges the importance of planning for sustenance in the city, realizing the challenges faced by Katerina's daughter who had to cover tuition, accommodation, food, and clothing. Despite leaving with minimal possessions, the speaker expresses determination to create a new and prosperous life, recognizing the need to secure employment for financial stability. The journey to finding employment was challenging, but Lisa soon secured a job thanks to Miranda, the owner of a small cafe near the institute. Miranda invited Lisa to handle evening dishwashing and cleaning duties, praising her for a job well done and offering a modest payment along with extra salad points. Miranda acknowledged the common issue of students needing redoing tasks and extended an invitation for Lisa to work evenings, emphasizing both the pay and the option to receive meals. This arrangement addressed the financial and nutritional aspects of Lisa's situation. Life became more manageable as Lisa took on part-time work in addition to her studies. However, a new challenge emerged when the dormitory superintendent announced a doubling of rent causing discontent among the students who protested the additional charges for subpar living conditions. Lisa, facing a genuine financial crisis, couldn't turn to her parents for assistance. The need for a second job arose, and Miranda, being a valuable source of support, suggested seeking employment at a bar owned by an acquaintance down the street. Despite the increased workload at the bar compared to Miranda's cafe, Lisa accepted the opportunity for additional income and destability, despite the demanding night shifts that extended until 7 o'clock in the morning. Lisa found the compensation satisfactory. Her classes at the institute commenced at 8 o'clock, allowing her enough time to prepare and even take a shower in the staff room. Unfortunately, this tight schedule left no room for sleep. Lisa, who would previously fall asleep instantly upon lying down, now couldn't afford such a luxury. She would doze off in the streetcar on her way to the institute or work, illustrating the extent of her exhaustion. This lack of control over her sleep patterns became noticeable to professors, who observed Lisa nodding off during lectures. They couldn't understand the sudden change in behavior from a dedicated student and medalist. Concerns arose among the faculty, with some speculating about laziness or a potential romantic involvement. The professors contemplated the possibility of Lisa's expulsion due to her deteriorating academic performance. Marked by pale skin, under-eye bruises, and trembling hands. However, there was also a glimmer of hope that it might be a temporary phase related to love or other personal matters. Lisa faced a significant setback when she had to transfer from a public school to a fee-paying one. Indicating financial constraints. She recognized the increasing difficulty of her studies and the need for a third part-time job to cover school expenses. Despite the challenges, Lisa's determination to overcome adversity and avoid letting her family down prevailed. The prospect of disappointment and embarrassment loomed large. But Lisa was accustomed to facing difficult circumstances. She pressed on, acknowledging that her busy schedule had its advantages including a certain obliviousness to loneliness and the passing charms of college life shared with classmates. 
Lisa faced challenges in making friends due to time constraints and her prior limited interactions with girls. While she had been comfortable with guys in her rural surroundings, the city boys appeared overly ambitious and hard to connect with. However, making friends was not Lisa's primary goal. Her schedule left little room for friendship. Responding to her aloofness, some considered Lisa sullen and unapproachable, opting to bypass her, which she deemed the preferable option. Others, unaware of the reason for her isolation, showed sympathy and attempted to include her in their social circles. While it sometimes required fending off well-intentioned but intrusive VE individuals, the worst were those who aimed to hurt her without reason. Mostly guys, William, in particular, developed an interest in Lisa and persistently asked her out. Lisa politely refused initially, but William continued with increasingly inappropriate advances until she had to firmly reject him, leading to his displeasure. In retaliation, William spread false tales about Lisa around the institute, attempting to justify his own rejection and deflect ridicule from his friends. His storytelling skills made it challenging for others to question the absurdity of his claims. William, seeking revenge for his failure with Lisa, insinuated that she engaged in questionable activities at the bar where she worked nights. The gossip painted a distorted picture of Lisa, portraying her as somehow entirely different from her outward appearance and stressing the difficulties she faced in balancing work and studies. While it would be pleasant to add some excitement to life, I believe the instructors would disapprove. She maintains a dignified facade, akin to a discreet gray mouse that effortlessly navigates through routine activities. Come evening, a transformation occurs, and it's not motivated by financial gain. As she charges a modest fee, I can't help but wonder if she's grappling with a severe illness. Given her persistent concern for obstacles, if that were the case, she probably wouldn't have pursued her studies. It's a facade a way to distance herself from her parents or perhaps evade authorities. I assert that, as a student, she experiences the typical challenges of insufficient sleep and meals. However, she barely spends any time in the dormitory, visiting only once a week. Following this conversation, rumors circulated, some dismissed them with laughter, while others embraced the details of Lisa's alleged adventures. She paid little attention to sidelong glances, giggles, and whispers. It didn't register on her radar. People indulge in fabrications. And Lisa was determined not to be swayed by baseless gossip. Lisa's circumstances took a turn when she acquired a third part-time job. Many would argue that such a hectic lifestyle is detrimental. And they wouldn't be wrong. Lisa had forsaken the concepts of sleep, rest, and proper nutrition. However, she saw no alternative. If she failed to pay her tuition promptly, expulsion loomed over her, and the same fate awaited her if her academic performance faltered. In her pursuit of education, Lisa relied solely on he, herself. She ventured into a challenging role as a hospital nurse, a familiar territory given her responsibilities back in the village where maintaining order in the household fell on her shoulders due to her younger sisters and her mother's lack of focus on cleanliness. Unfazed by chaos, Lisa, accustomed to a clean and orderly environment, stumbled upon the job opportunity by chance. Determined not to let it slip away, she bypassed a phone call and promptly met with the employers, securing the position she desperately needed. After Lisa began working at the hospital, Sleep became a luxury she couldn't afford. However, the financial reward was substantial, and Lisa wisely saved the money instead of spending it. She earmarked these savings to cover her tuition. Despite the persistent fatigue, she might have even enjoyed the job if it weren't for the demanding schedule. The hospital staff treated her well, recognizing her diligence. The work was challenging, but the salary exceeded the combined earnings from both of her jobs at the bars. Lisa prioritized her hospital job, coordinating with other employers to align with the hospital's less convenient schedule, encompassing both night and day shifts. Despite her exhaustion, older nurses occasionally allowed her to nap during the workday, a gesture Lisa always declined, unaccustomed to passing her responsibilities on to others. Yet, 
sympathetic colleagues insisted that a brief nap would rejuvenate her, emphasizing the positive impact on her well-being. Even patients appreciated Lisa's dedication, and the head nurse, Kelly, often invited her for tea. Doctors greeted her politely in the corridors. Overall, Lisa found contentment in her life. The limited time for sleep each day didn't bother her too much. She needed the money and earned it willingly. In her fleeting thoughts, Lisa acknowledged that she had no time or energy for dreams. But she embraced the philosophy of learning and living. Despite her hectic schedule, she considered herself fortunate. One day, as Lisa was cleaning the emergency room floors, a sudden commotion disrupted the routine. A nurse informed her that they had a critical patient from an accident, and Lisa was dismissed from her cleaning duties. Acknowledging the urgency, she stepped aside as a stretcher rushed through the open door carrying a young girl in a dire condition. Despite her previous beauty, the girl's delicate face was now distorted by suffering. Stained with blood, and her once expen, Siv attire was torn. The unconscious state of the girl was evident, marking a stark contrast to her former appearance. The stretcher now carried a young boy, resembling the injured girl but exuding a different kind of beauty, masculine and rugged. He appeared to have suffered less than the girl, and despite the circumstances, he maintained a composed demeanor. Not a single blemish marred his perfect haircut and his confident brown eyes radiated assurance that everything would be alright. He pleaded for help, emphasizing his sister's critical condition and his father's willingness to spare no expense for their care. Amidst the urgency, the nurse instructed Lisa to tend to the boy, who seemed to be in shock. The young man was taken aside for examination while Lisa, though puzzled by her sudden freeze, focused on her responsibilities. The injured girl was rushed to the operating room, the doctors attending to the boy's needs. Lisa, on the other hand, diligently began cleaning the blood-soaked floor, a task she had encountered frequently in the emergency room and wards. Strangely, this particular case struck a nerve. Lingering in her thoughts even after finishing her shift, curiosity led Lisa to inquire about the victim's fate, and the nurse assured her that the girl was alive, and the young man's injuries were not severe. The next day, Lisa learned more about the couple from Kelly. They were local deputies' children sent to the capital for studies but ended up in the hospital due to a car accident. Seemingly not their fault. Their father, upon receiving a call, arrived promptly and expressed a strong desire to transfer his daughter to a prestigious clinic. However, the doctor deemed it too risky to move her at the moment. The young man remained by his sister's side, highlighting the family's deep concern for their well-being. I've seen that deputy on TV several times, and there have been articles about him in the newspapers. I had no idea he had grown up kids. He always seemed so young himself. It's hard to imagine him looking like a deputy, especially considering their salaries and job responsibilities. I doubt he's scrubbing floors at night or taking five breaks a year at expensive resorts. He looks like someone who doesn't have to worry about such things. You're right. I haven't heard much about his family either. Maybe someone targeted them intentionally. As he doesn't seem to be handling things well with the kids and all. You know how kids like that grow you. P. Their brother and sister are twins and not much older than you. Here you are with a car. And they're out traveling the world. So they've done pretty well. They're alive. And with money for treatment and recovery. They should be fine. It's a shame about the girl. Though. Her injury was almost fatal. She's still alive. But recovery is uncertain. And there's a possibility of lifelong impairment. If she survives, her father might try to arrange some form of recovery for her young, healthy body. Something a guy can't handle well. Lisa agreed. Acknowledging that the rich also face challenges. While sipping tea and discussing the situation. She expressed pity for the girl and considered the uncertainties surrounding her future. Lisa pondered whether the father would go to great lengths to secure her recovery. After expressing gratitude for the tea, Lisa went to clean the rooms. Deeply engrossed in her thoughts, she was so absorbed that she didn't realize how she performed her tasks. There was one last room to clean, where the young man named Robert had been brought in the previous day. 
As she approached, she found the girl knocking and noticed the young man smoking by the window. Hello. I've come to clean your room. Lisa greeted. Entering the space. But you're not supposed to smoke. And it's detrimental to your health. Besides, smoking is prohibited in a hospital. What are you even talking about? The man responded angrily. Thank you. I was unsure whether to smoke or not. You shouldn't smoke. And you shouldn't leave ashes on the floor or discard cigarette butts randomly. I don't understand why you would litter. At the very least. Use a plate. Listen. Just take your mop and leave. I don't need your lectures. No one has taught me how to live. And no one is forbidding me anything. I'm simply asking you not to litter. This isn't your home. I noticed that Robert was speaking in a high-pitched voice. And soon one of the passing doctors overheard. He peeked into the room to see what was going on. And, unsurprisingly, Lisa was the culprit. What do you think you're doing? Sternly said the eye doctor. Why are you getting involved with a sick person? It doesn't seem to be part of your duties. If you continue, you'll be fired. Lisa, however, was not frightened by the threat. She understood that the doctor was being strict due to the patient's personality. But she was offended. After all, she was not guilty of anything. She was being scolded in front of a man who had already insulted her. Come on. What am I used to? He wasn't the first. And unfortunately, not the last. The girl worried herself. But the next day, the situation repeated itself. Robert seemed to have no intention of maintaining order in the hospital. The room was once again filled with smoke and garbage. And once again, Lisa did not hold back. You're probably doing all this to spite me. She said mockingly, pointing to the cigarette butts on the windowsill. Haven't you had enough of verbal abuse? Is this how you decide to act? Listen, if I take action, you'll be in trouble. What did the doctor tell you yesterday? Not to get into altercations with a sick man. It's not easy without you. I got hurt. And my sister is in intensive care. I don't know if she's going to make it. And here I am. Getting reprimanded by all this trash. Because you have to respect the work of any dumpster too. And your condition is no excuse. Everyone here is lying in a bad condition. But no one behaves so rudely. And I'm not like all of you. In case you haven't noticed. My stay here is paid for. Including cleaning and everything else. If you don't like the cleaning here. Just say so. They won't send another suitable cleaner. I'm not happy looking at your face either. You know, just because your beau gave you the eye doesn't mean you have to throw yourself at all the men. Lisa realized he was hinting at the deep shadows under her eyes. They did look awful. But it wasn't her fault. And it certainly wasn't because of some non-existent suitor. Robert's words hurt the girl. And she silently began to clean the room. Lowering her head and doing her best not to show her resentment. Despite her efforts, tears welled up in her eyes. Washed out nerves didn't hold back emotions. No matter how hard Lisa tried to hide her resentment. The young man noticed it. And apparently. He felt ashamed. When Lisa finished her work and was about to leave. He apologized. Saying. Okay. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to insult you. I'm just nervous. This stupid trauma. My dad's in trouble. My sister doesn't know if she's going to make it. So I snapped. I won't be rude anymore. I can see that your eyes aren't puffy. You're probably just tired. That's all right. Lisa mumbled. Wiping away the tears that had fallen during his penitential speech. And I hear your sister's condition has stabilized. Her life is out of danger. Soon. You'll be able to visit her and talk to her. With that. She quickly picked up her work instruments and left. T the room. Robert was discharged two weeks later. And during that time, he and Lisa didn't talk much. She would just come into the room, say hello, do her chores, and leave. However, sometimes they would catch a glimpse of each other, a fleeting glance that flickered. She looked at him the same way, trying not to give herself away when she heard he was being discharged. The girl couldn't help but rejoice. Finally, this ordeal would be over. She thought to herself, it's not about you guys. She mused next to him. Imagine. As he put it. 
A wet chicken or something. Well, that's what she is. No matter how she talked herself and tried to be sad. She also realized that it was unlikely they would ever see each other again. Alona, Robert's sister, was still in the hospital. Though no longer in intensive care. She had been moved to a regular ward as her condition was improving. Having been in a medically induced coma. Lisa diligently mopped the floors of her ward daily and conversed with the unfortunate woman. Confident that Alona could hear and understand everything. This. In Lisa's mind. Meant that Alona's brain was responding. Giving signals to her body in aiding in her healing. Whether this assumption was true remained unknown. But Lisa took comfort in thinking she had done something beneficial for a man at risk of disability. What she did not know was that her sincere and touching monologues were not only heard by Alona but also by Robert. Who was in the room next to hers. The rooms communicated with each other. And Robert realized that Lisa was not just a tormented nurse. She was actually an interesting, determined, kind, and strong girl. Their next encounter after discharge was entirely coincidental. One day, as Lisa was returning from work, she saw her classmates outside a restaurant. Spotting Lisa, the group of guys and girls surrounded her, inviting her to join them in the hall. They urged her to sit with them, have fun, and finally participate in at least one event. What do you say, Lisa? We studied together for so many years. And you still seem like a stranger. You're never caught. Never invited anywhere. Come on. Let's go sit down for five minutes. All right. All right. I'll sit with you for five minutes. Have a coffee. And then I'll go. Promise you won't hold me up. I really don't have time. I'm very tired. Lissa agreed reluctantly. In the hall. She saw among the gathered her mysterious adversary. William. But it was too late to turn back. She hoped that. In fro. NT of everyone. This unpleasant guy would not bother her. Unfortunately. She was mistaken. William immediately sat closer to her. Making his usual dirty innuendos and trying to grab her knees under the table. Insisting she have a glass of wine or vodka. Realizing that nothing good would come out of these gatherings. Lisa grew uneasy. Lisa got up bid farewell to everyone, and left. However, her tormentor, William, followed closely behind. Look, William, what do you want from me? Lisa exclaimed with annoyance. Since freshman year, you don't give me a break. Moreover, you're spreading gossip for what? Just go sit with the rest of us. Stay out of my way, please. Oh, come on. Stay out of it. You prude. Tell me. For God's sake. I've been bothering you. Haven't I? You're the one making eyes at me all the time. William retorted. All right. Don't pretend. I know where you're rushing to and from work. Why are you so tired? Maybe you've served too many people today. And you don't have the energy anymore. Stop it. You idiot. Lisa snapped. His girlfriend smelled it. But William didn't bother to lie. He grabbed Lisa by the elbow and turned her against the wall. Facing him with his hands against the wall so she couldn't get away. Stop trying to make a fool out of yourself in front of me. You may have fooled anyone else. But not me. I know all about you. He smelled strongly of alcohol. Tobacco. And sweat. And his oily eyes stared at her body. She knew he was about to let his hands fly. But she couldn't cry out for help. Who would stand up for her? Just at that moment, Robert walked past. He had visited his sister and was on his way home from the hospital, where his father was waiting with his constant criticisms and sermons. He didn't even recognize Lisa in such an unpleasant situation. And when he did, he quickly walked over, took William by the shoulder, and turned him toward him. What's going on here? Why aren't you letting the girl pass? And who are you? Robert questioned. Two people are arguing. The third does not interfere. That's my woman. I do what I want. And you can go your own way. Robert. Help me get rid of this scoundrel. Lisa pleaded. You know we have nothing in common. He just drank. Although he's no better when he's sober. He's my classmate. All right. Lisa. I'll take you to your classmate. 
and we'll talk. I have to explain to him what's what. Robert answered. Taking William aside, Lisa couldn't hear what the two young men were talking about. William quickly withdrew. B. U.T. Robert, on the contrary, approached her and placed his arm around her. Let me accompany you outside. Don't decline. Considering the late hour. It's the least I can do. I always come here after my shift. It's usually uneventful. However, this time, some classmates were celebrating at the restaurant. And William spotted me. He became overly attached. Robert explained. When asked if she wanted to sit with her friends, Lisa declined, expressing her disinterest in such gatherings. Despite knowing each other since freshman year, Lisa conveyed her busy schedule, and Robert acknowledged her uniqueness. Despite their swift arrival at the dormitory, parting ways seemed unsettling. Concerns about not seeing each other again lingered, prompting Robert to suggest another meeting. Lisa agreed without perceiving the encounter as harassment. Their subsequent conversations revealed a deeper connection, leaving Lisa hesitant about the potential future of their relationship. Despite her feelings for Robert, societal expectations loomed large. Lisa, a dishwasher, and Robert, a man from a wealthy family, faced challenges. However, Robert's genuine actions, such as defending Lisa from harassment, from set him apart from others. William, who once pursued Lisa, eventually backed off, leading to a more positive atmosphere and dispelling rumors about her. Life became more comfortable and enjoyable for Lisa. Thanks to meeting Robert, Lisa found herself increasingly drawn to him. Despite the effort it took to conceal her feelings, she couldn't deny that she was becoming attached to the young man who courted her. While she didn't outright refuse to meet with him, their interactions were not typical of romantic dates. Lisa limited their encounters to walks home and a handshake goodbye. Robert, hopeful for more, would occasionally express his desire for additional time together. He proposed various activities, from walks in the park to outings and even trips to other cities. Lisa, appreciative of his gestures, explained her time constraints due to academic commitments. She clarified that she couldn't envision a future for their relationship emphasizing that she wasn't expecting a marriage proposal. Despite Robert's assurances of genuine feelings, Lisa insisted that only time would reveal the true nature of their connection. Robert expressed his willingness to prove the depth of his emotions, emphasizing his capacity for genuine feelings. However, Lisa, while acknowledging his sincerity, Maine, tamed that her current circumstances didn't permit her to entertain such desires. She was going through a challenging period and couldn't commit to future plans. Lisa remained apprehensive, fearing that Robert might inquire about her family, particularly her parents. Unbeknownst to him, her father was a village drunkard, and her mother, worn out from work, did not fit societal expectations of beauty. Lisa chose not to disclose these details, keeping her family background hidden. When she left her relatives home, she seldom visited and communicated with them, guarding the secret aspects of her life. The situation was challenging for Lisa on two fronts. Firstly, the cost of visiting her relatives was high. Secondly, her family expected more than just her presence. They anticipated gifts for her younger siblings, such as candies, city toys, and clothes. Simply providing money to her parents without tangible gifts would likely be misunderstood and possibly lead to offense. The letters she received from her mother were filled with half-hearted remarks about her father's drunken behavior, his inappropriate name-calling, and how Lisa had grown up to be different from what her mother had envisioned. Her mother had hoped Lisa would grow up to be a helper, naming her after her hard-working grandmother. Instead, Lisa had chosen to live independently in the city. The letters conveyed a sense of disappointment, with her mother expressing regret about not receiving practical help and resenting Lisa's city life. Lisa felt a mix of shame and offense, particularly when her mother compared her to others who had children to help. The expectations for Lisa to send practical items like rubber boots clashed with the reality of city life, where money wasn't readily available on the streets. The letters also highlighted the financial struggles faced by Lisa's family and their disdain for her urban lifestyle. 
One day during her shift at the hospital, Lisa was approached by a passing nurse who mentioned another person with the unusual last name Arellan. It turned out to be someone named Kevin. And Lisa, surprised by the coincidence, rushed to room 16 where he was located. Her father's name was Kevin. And she hadn't considered the possibility of such a connection. This unexpected discovery hinted at her father's serious health condition. As he had been sent to a town hospital instead of being treated in their village. Lisa pondered whether her mother had been truthful about her father's abstinence from drinking or if the situation was more severe than simply quitting alcohol could resolve. Lisa immediately recognized her father upon entering the hospital room and was struck by his deteriorating appearance. He had visibly lost weight. And his sunken eyes gave the impression of someone gravely ill. Quietly approaching the bunk. She called out to him. Daddy. He didn't respond and she was informed that he had been injected with something to help him rest. An older man in the next bunk reassured her that letting him sleep was beneficial and would make it easier for him. Feeling a heavy heart, Lisa left the room quietly. As it was late and the attending physician had already left the hospital, she decided to postpone the conversation with the doctor until the next day. Even though the severity of her father's condition was evident even without professional input. Returning to the hostel that night, Lisa was in a somber mood. Despite her mother's recent optimistic letters about her father's improved behavior and efforts to repair the house, reality painted a different picture. She sympathized with her father. And the contrast with her mother's hopeful words added to her distress. The next day, Lisa spoke to the doctor, who delivered grim news. The years of alcohol abuse had severely damaged her father's liver. And a transplant was the only viable option for recovery. The doctor explained that even a fraction of a liver transplant could provide a chance for recovery. But it was a complex and costly procedure. The doctor emphasized the urgent need for the transplant. As her father's life expectancy without it was limited. Lisa's hopes dimmed as the doctor disclosed the exorbitant cost of the operation. Her family had no such funds. And even if the entire village contributed. It would likely fall short. Overwhelmed by the financial burden. Lisa left the doctor's office in tears. Showing up in such a state to her father's room was not allowed. And she sought solace in the office where Kelly, a colleague, was sitting. Concerned. Kelly inquired about Lisa's absence from her shift. Unaware of the devastating news she had just received. I approached him to inquire about my father. A matter of great seriousness. After discussing it with Jacob. I found myself unsure of what to do. Lisa, in tears, confided in Kelly about her current worries. Although the nurse empathized, she couldn't offer any assistance. Unbeknownst to the women, Robert overheard their so envy. Bersation as Lisa entered the office without closing the door behind her. Recognizing an opportunity to convey the depth of his feelings for Lisa, Robert chose a different approach. Despite sensing her reluctance, he knew how much she meant to him. Realizing that traditional methods wouldn't sway Lisa, Robert decided to organize a charity to raise funds for Kevin's treatment. He utilized his father's connections and openly shared Kevin's story. Acknowledging past mistakes but emphasizing a father with many children striving for redemption. Understanding that garnering support for an elderly former alcoholic wouldn't be easy. He presented the situation with honesty and positivity. The fundraising gained momentum and the necessary amount was swiftly raised. Reporting the success to an astonished and elated Lissa, she questioned how he achieved it. Robert reassured her, expressing that people, for the most part, are kind and willing to help. He explained the importance of effectively conveying requests and pointed out that love, too, can motivate people to perform altruistic acts. Lissa looked at him with tearful eyes, filled with happiness and gratitude. She found herself unable to articulate her feelings. But for the first time, she wholeheartedly believed in Robert's love. Gratitude for saving her father evolved into amazement at the unparalleled sympathy and willingness to help she had never experienced before. With the prospect of her father's healthy future, there arose hope for a better life for her mother and younger siblings. Observing Lissa's transformed attitude towards Robert after he funded her father's surgery, it became evident that their relationship had deepened. 
no longer resistant to meetings or disheartened by business matters. Lissa embraced their time together as genuine lovers. Happiness filled her. And she reproached herself for the lost time in refusing her boyfriend for so long. Their walks around the city often concluded in a quaint hotel, where they shared wonderful moments. News of their relationship spread among those around them, including Charles, Robert's father, who wasn't just unhappy but furious. Charles had not seen eye to eye with Robert since his teenage years, and matters worsened after Robert graduated from high school, choosing his own path. Although Charles did his best for his children, his efforts often fell short. Another disaster struck when Robert entertained the idea of marriage, catching Charles off guard, determined, in to move his ailing daughter from the local hospital to a private clinic for a quicker and guaranteed recovery. Charles faced resistance from the hospital staff. The doctors, unaware of Charles's financial capacity, resisted the move, emphasizing the dangers of relocating the daughter. Charles, grateful for their care but resolute in his decision, highlighted the superior medical care and trained nurses available at the private clinic. The private clinic boasted all the necessary facilities for Alona's swift rehabilitation, including a swimming pool and a gym. Acknowledging this, Charles realized that his own hospital lacked these amenities crucial for Alona's rapid recovery. Determined to provide the best care for his daughter, he decided against keeping her at their hospital. However, the hospital staff insisted that Charles sign a receipt, acknowledging the risks and taking full responsibility for moving Alona. Charles complied, assuring them that he had fulfilled all the required documentation. Satisfied, he proceeded to visit his daughter. On the way to Alona's room, Charles paused to unwrap a bouquet of flowers. He overheard a conversation between Alona and another girl, possibly a friend or a visiting nurse. Choosing not to interrupt their discussion, Charles waited outside the room, eager to give them some privacy. The conversation revolved around love with the girl expressing doubts about the chances of a successful relationship. Alona disagreed, asserting that if two people love each other, obstacles shouldn't matter. The friend encouraged her to stand by her choice, even if it meant defying disapproval. Mentioning Robert as an example, these words began to trouble Charles as he realized they aligned with the plans he had recently learned about from both his son and daughter. Although the prospect of a romantic relationship between Robert and Alona didn't sit well with him, Charles chose not to reveal that he had overheard their conversation. Instead, he deliberately made a loud entrance, knocking on the door as if he had just arrived. Upon entering, Charles greeted Alona and turned to the other girl, asking if she was a nurse. She timidly corrected him, confirming that she was indeed a nurse, then gathered her belongings and left the room. Charles refrained from discussing what he had overheard with his daughter, despite his attempts to engage her in conversation about various topics. However, the information he gathered made it evident that his S. On. Robert. Intended to marry a nurse. Charles found this prospect unrealistic. Even considering the girl's attractiveness. Upon investigating further, he discovered that the nurse was a student and details about her relationship with Robert were not pleasing to him. Despite his reservations, Charles had no intention of interfering in his son's affairs. He would have been content with Robert's wedding, but on the condition that it didn't involve the nurse. Charles had a specific candidate in mind for Robert, a gorgeous girl from a fine family, educated, intelligent, and seemingly a perfect match for business. However, Robert seemed determined to choose his own path, opting for a relationship with a less conventional partner. Charles encountered Lisa as she exited the hospital and decided to speak with her. Despite his imposing presence, Lisa, initially frightened, confirmed her friendship with Robert. Charles then alluded to hearing about a romantic involvement between her and Robert, to which Lisa, gaining confidence, admitted to their love affair. Charles, Amused and somewhat sorry for the situation, expressed his desire for a different connection with Robert. He couldn't fathom why his son chose a less conventional partner when there were seemingly better options available. Lisa, however, defended the love she shared with Robert, asserting that it was a wonderful feeling. I was once young myself, 
And I understand the concept of love. The man grinned. However, I would like to caution you against being overly confident in your current situation. You may believe that you are in a serious relationship with Robert. Anticipating a future proposal, marriage, and a lifelong commitment. Allow me to enlighten you. It's merely a pipe dream. I haven't made any such claims. My dreams are my own business. Lisa retorted firmly, maintaining her composure. Be polite. Honey, I'm still older than you. She added, brushing off the insinuations. As the supposed father of your fiancé, I can assure you there is no genuine relationship between you two. Robert has a fiancé, and he is deeply committed to her. Talks of their impending marriage are already circulating. Look at these recent pictures. He continued, displaying images on his phone screen. You'll notice Robert with another girl, displaying affection. I don't understand why you're sharing all this with me. I have no plans involving your son. Rest assured. I won't take him from that girl. Let them be happy. Lisa responded. Curtly. You're a smart girl. That's a good thing. I realize I may be shattering some of your dreams. And I'm willing to compensate for the trouble I've caused. I can cover your tuition at the institute and help you find accommodation promptly. He offered. Thank you but I don't need anything from you. Lisa cut him off. Walking away, the man muttered after her. So poor but proud. But she remained steadfast in her pride. As Lisa quickly distanced herself, she tried to contain her emotions and prevent tears from escaping. The unfolding events were precisely as she had anticipated. While she harbored feelings for Robert, she knew she couldn't defy her father's wishes. Eventually, he would marry the one chosen by Charles. The girl in the pictures wasn't just attractive but also well-dressed and well-groomed. Such a girl, who has never washed a plate for others in her life, is the type of bride a wealthy man should have. In light of this, it seems appropriate for Lisa to gracefully step aside. All for the happiness of her lover. Lisa left him, abandoned him, and confessed that she never loved him. That she had deceived him. He still remembered her somber voice asking him if he was sorry for being deceived. She explained that she didn't mean to deceive him but didn't know how to express gratitude for what he had done for her father. Now realizing that she can't lie anymore, she declared they wouldn't see each other again, expressing her apologies and wishing him happiness without her. Despite a stint at a private clinic, Robert's condition didn't improve, and soon he was discharged from the hospital. Lisa. Now at home sought answers from her brother about what happened between him and Lisa. Uninterested and dismissive, Robert insisted he had likely offended her. But Alana, Lisa's sister, was determined to uncover the truth. Alana, concerned about Lisa's abrupt departure from the hospital, visited the facility where Lisa worked. Instead of approaching the orderlies, she sought out Kelly, who had a good rapport with Lisa. Alona asked Kelly for Lisa's contact information, emphasizing the importance of reaching out to her. Kelly suggested checking the personnel office for her address but mentioned that it was currently vacant. However, she advised Alana to visit a bar where Lisa worked, believing she would likely find out more about the situation there. Determined to unravel the mystery, Alana followed Kelly's suggestion and went to the bar. At the bar, Alana was fortunate to encounter Lisa, and their reunion was filled with warmth, as if they were old friends. Alana questioned Lisa's abrupt departure without saying goodbye, expressing her disappointment at waiting for her. Lisa, unapologetic, explained it was due to circumstances beyond her control, thanking Kelly for providing Alana with information about her whereabouts. They found a secluded corner to catch up. Alana delved into the mystery surrounding Lisa's sudden departure particularly concerning Robert. Lisa revealed that circumstances led to her decision, but she couldn't elaborate further. Alana expressed confusion, and Lisa became gloomy, hinting at the seriousness of their circumstances. Elena, not sympathetic, commented on Lisa almost ruining everything with her refusal. Alana questioned Lisa about Robert's current state, mentioning his gloominess, sadness, drinking, and involvement in a fight. Lisa. Frightened. 
shared that her father had decided to send Robert abroad, fearing he might turn to crime. Alana asked why Lisa suddenly wanted to see Robert, questioning if she wanted to witness his suffering. Lisa clarified she didn't want him to suffer. Instead, she wished everyone to be happy. Lisa confided in Alana, revealing her father's intervention. He met with Lisa and requested her to step aside. As Robert had a prospective bride from a good family, Lisa obediently complied. And now she urgently needed to see Robert and explain herself before he left. Alana found the situation outrageous, questioning their father's interference in Lisa's life. Lisa requested Alana's help to talk to Robert before he left, fearing he would spend his life thinking she had been unkind, acknowledging their father's controlling nature. Alana proposed going to the airport together the next day, allowing Lisa to talk to Robert before his departure. Lisa thanked Alana and expressed her initial belief that Robert loved someone else. Fueled by pictures Charles had shown her, Alana encouraged Lisa to talk to Robert the next day to clear up the confusion. Lisa hoped everything would fall into place, and Alana assured her they would address the situation before Robert's departure. Lately, Robert hasn't been himself. The next day, the girls hurried to the airport, expecting only Charles, Lisa's father, to see Robert off. They felt that he shouldn't interfere with the farewell between the two lovers. As Robert was leaving anyway, everything should have transpired smoothly, but it appeared they were either too late or Alona had miscalculated the time. Upon reaching the airport building, they heard that the plane Robert was supposed to board had already taken off. Alona and Lisa were devastated, realizing Lisa had missed her last chance to see the person she loved. Lisa sat on a bench, tears streaming down her face, feeling that Robert had flown away, and there was no way to undo it. Alona comforted her, and suddenly, Someone else's arms wrapped around them, it was Robert. Confused by his presence, the girls asked why he didn't get on the plane. Robert explained that he had told Alona he didn't want to go anywhere and decided not to leave. Despite Charles being upset with him for running away, Robert no longer cared about anything. Lisa stood up, hugged Robert, and confessed that she loved him, that everything she had said earlier was a lie, and she had chickened out. Robert calmly asked why he didn't get on the plane and revealed that Charles was with him. Accepting their relationship, Alona backed up her brother, asserting that he could interfere in anything except his own business. Despite Charles's attempts to break them up, Robert and Lisa were determined to be together. In the face of Charles's emotional language, Robert and Lisa walked away with their arms around each other, ready to start their new life far from any convention. Above is today's story. If you like it, please subscribe and give it a thumbs up. See you next time.